in 922 AD, wrapped in so many clothes that he could barely move, a Muslim Arab envoy from Baghdad, an ambassador, encountered a party of Viking traders on the upper reaches of the Volga River in today's Russia. Reporting on his diplomatic mission, Ibn Fadlan offered a detailed description of Viking customs, dress, religion and sexual practices, as well as the only surviving witness account we have of a ship cremation. I'm going to read to you his account of this cremation. It's absolutely fascinating and very disturbing. A shocking ritual involving the haunting figure of the angel of death. Humane, inquisitive and written without any moral judgment, despite the often alarming nature of what he saw, Ibn Fadlan's account is one of the earliest we have of the Viking way of life and a fascinating record of, the fir of one of the first encounters between Northern Europe and the Muslim world. And I'm going to be reading from the Penguin Classics edition of his writings. There we are. It's called Ibn Fadlan and the Land of Darkness. And it actually contains other essays by other very early Arab traders and explorers, all very, very interesting. And on page 49, as I say, he describes in great detail uh, this um, the burial and the burning of the Viking nobleman. And just a warning, uh, some of these details are very disturbing. Some of them are almost pornographic. So if if that's going to be an issue, please uh, don't listen any further. But it is a dispassionate account of what he saw. So it is a, a great benefit to us uh, much, much later to see how the very earliest Muslim explorers and diplomats saw the rest of the world around them. So on page 49, he writes, and the heading here, there's little uh, sub-chapters, headings by Penguin, I think, the burial of a great man, it says. And our author writes... They say that when their great men die, they do all kinds of things to them, of which burning is the least. I wanted to have certain knowledge of this, but did not until one day I learned of the death of one of their great men. They placed him in his grave, that is, in the ground, and which they covered with a roof, and they left him there for ten days, waiting while they finished cutting and sewing his garments. The burial of a poor man. If the dead man was poor, they built him a small boat and place him in it and set it on fire. If he was wealthy, they gather together his fortune and divide it into three parts. One for his family, one to have his clothes cut out for him and another to have the wine prepared that they will drink on the day that his slave girl kills herself and is burned with her master. Now, a lot of this account, which I'm going to read, is taken up with the preparation and selection of this slave girl, what happens to her and her terrible end. And that's where it gets very, very disturbing, I think. For they, for they drink wine unrestrainedly, night and day, so that sometimes one of them dies with his wine cup in his hand. Funeral of a noble. When a great man dies, the members of his family say to his slave girls and young slave boys, which of you will die with him? One of them replies, I will. Once they have spoken, it is irreversible and there is no turning back. If they want to change their mind, they would not be allowed to. Usually it is the slave girls who offer to die. It's interesting, why should it be the slave girls normally and not the slave boys? We're not told. When the man whom I mentioned above died, they said to his slave girls, who will die with him? One of them says, I will. Then they appointed two young slave girls to watch over her and follow her everywhere she went, sometimes even washing her feet with their own hands. Everyone busies himself about the dead man, cutting out clothes for him and preparing everything that he will need. It's interesting, he will need things even though he's dead. Meanwhile, the slave girl spends each day drinking and singing happily and joyfully. So why would she be happy 
and joy, full of joy. Well, it becomes clearer towards the end, just before she's killed, why uh, apparently she is joyful and happy. When the day came that the man was to be burned and the girl with him, I went to the river where his boat was anchored. I saw that they had drawn his boat up onto the shore and that four posts uh, of birch or other wood had been driven into the ground and round these posts a framework of wood had been erected. Next, they drew up the boat until it rested on this wooden construction. Then they came forward, coming and going, pronouncing words which I did not understand, while the man was still in his grave, not yet taken out. By the way, this is the only account we have in the world of a Viking burial <clears throat> where the, the body was burned. The next subheading is the angel of death. This is where it gets a bit grim. Then they brought a bed and placed it on the boat and covered it with a mattress and cushions of Byzantine silk brocade. That's very nice. Then came an old woman whom they called the angel of death and she spread the bed with coverings we have just mentioned. She is in charge of sewing and arranging all these things, and it is she who kills the slave girls. I saw that she was a witch, thick-bodied and sinister. This is the Arab Muslim ambassador witnessing this. When they came to the tomb of the dead man, they removed the earth from the top of the wood, and then the wood itself, and they took out the dead man wrapped in the garment in which he died. I saw that he had turned black because of the coldness of the country. They had put wine in the tomb with him and fruit and a drum. Not sure why, but they took all this out. The dead men did not the dead man did not smell bad, and nothing about him had changed except his colour. They dressed him in trousers, sock, socks, boots, a tunic, and a brocade caftan with gold buttons. On his head, they placed a brocade cap covered with sable, with kind of a black colour. Then they bore him into the pavilion on the boat and sat him on the mattress, supported by cushions. Then they brought wine, fruit and basil, which they placed near him. Next, they carried him bread, meat, onions, which they laid before him. I'm quite sure why, but they, that's what they did. The next section is uh, entitled Sacrifice Animals, Sacrificial Animals. After that, they brought in a dog, which they cut in two and threw into the boat. Then they placed his weapons beside him. Next, they took two horses and made them run until they were in lather. In other words, they were foaming at the mouth from exhaustion before hacking them to pieces with swords and throwing their flesh onto the boat. Then they brought two cows, you can guess what happened to them, which they also cut into pieces and threw them onto the boat. Finally, they brought a cock and a hen, killed them and threw them onto the boat as well. Now, the next section is where it gets pornographic, but I say this is a almost scientific academic description of what he saw uh, for the caliph back in Baghdad. You know, who were these people? And this is what they did. So this is a kind of diplomatic report uh, for uh, the Islamic uh, Empire. And the section is entitled, The Slave Girl Has Sex With Those Present. Meanwhile, the slave girl who wanted to be killed came and went, entering in turn each of the pavilions that had been built. And the master of each pavilion had intercourse with her, saying, Tell your master, the dead man, that I only did this for your love of him. Next section. The slave girl gazes on paradise. So this is why now she's so full of joy, allegedly. On Friday, when the time had come for the evening prayer, I'm not sure if he means Maghrib or he's talking about the Viking prayer, I don't know. They, they led the slave girl towards something that they had constructed and which looked like the frame of a door. They placed her feet on the palms of the hands of the men until she could look over the frame. She said some words and they let her down. They then raised her a second time and she did as she had the first 
and then they set her down again. And the third time she did as she had done the other two. Then they brought her a chicken. She cut off its head and tossed it away. Then they took the chicken and threw it onto the boat. I asked the interpreter, this is the Arab ambassador, I asked the interpreter what she had been doing. It was very mysterious. He replied, the first time they lifted her up, she said, I see my, my father and my mother. The second time she said, there I see all my dead relatives sitting. And the third time she said, there I see my master, the dead guy, sitting in paradise and paradise is green and beautiful. There are men with him and young people and, sh and he is calling me, take me to him, end quote. So that's why she's happy. She's expecting to be reunited with her dead master and joining other people as well. Our author continues, they went off with her towards the boat. She took off the two bracelets that she was wearing and gave them both to the old woman who was known as the angel of death. She who was to kill her. Then she stripped off her two anklets, her kind of ankle bracelets, and gave them to the two young girls, the slaves who had served her. They were the daughters of the woman called the angel of death. Then the men lifted her onto the boat, but did not let her enter the pavilion. Next, men came with shields and staves. This is getting really heated up now. They handed the girl a cup of wine. She sang a song over it and drank. The interpreter translated what she was saying and explained that she was bidding all her female companions farewell. Then they gave her another cup. I keep on plying it with alcohol, you see. She took it and continued singing for a long time, while the old woman, you know, the angel of death, encouraged her to drink and then urged her to enter the pavilion and join her master. It's getting sinister now. I saw that the girl did not know what she was doing. Well, she's obviously completely drunk by this point. She wanted to enter the pavilion, but she put her head between it and the boat. Then the old woman seized her head, made her enter the pavilion and went in with her. The men began to bang on their shields with staves to drown her cries so that the other slave girls would not be frightened and try to avoid dying with their masters. How thoughtful. Next, six men entered the pavilion and lay with the girl, one after another, after which they laid her beside her master. So in other words, they had intercourse with her. Two seized her feet and two others her hands. The old woman called the angel of death came and put a cord round her neck in such a way that the two ends went in opposite directions. She gave the ends to two of the men so that they could pull on them. Then she herself approached the girl, holding in her hand a dagger with a broad blade and plunged it again and again between the girl's ribs. While the two men strangled her with the cord until she was dead. And then the next uh, section is uh, entitled The Burning of the Boat. This is the famous burning of the Viking boat with the deceased and a slave and the horses and the cows and everything else all on board. Next, the closest male relative of the dead man came forward and took a piece of wood which he lit at a fire. He then walked backwards towards the boat. His face turned towards the people who were there, one hand holding the piece of flaming wood, the other covering his anus, for he was naked. Very odd point there. Thus he set fire to the wood that had been set already under the boat after they had placed the slave girl beside her master. Then the people came with wood and logs to burn, each holding a piece of a wood alight at one end, which they threw on the wood. The fire enveloped the wood, then the boat, then the tent, 
then the man, the girl, and all that there was on the boat. A violent and frightening wind began to blow. The flames grew in strength and the heat of the fire intensified. Now, this is the last section, uh, which I think is particularly interesting. It's entitled, Why the Rus Burn the Dead. Rus is, in other words, the Russians, the Russian Vikings. Why do they burn the dead? One of the Rus was standing beside me and I heard him speak to my interpreter. I asked the latter what he had said. He replied, you Arabs are fools. Why is that? I asked him. He said, because you put the men you love most and the most noble among you into the earth and the earth and the worms and the insects eat them. But we burn them in the fire in an instant so that at once and without delay, they enter paradise. Then he began to laugh in a very excessive way. I asked him why he was laughing and he said, His Lord, for love of him, has sent a wind that will bear him hence within the hour. And indeed, not an hour had passed before the ship, wood, girl and master were no more than ashes and dust. So there we are. That's the end of the quote. And he goes on to talk about the uh, the grave mound that was then made and so on. And so it's a fascinating account. But what I like at the end there is the cultural differences between the Vikings and the Muslims. The Muslims, of course, bury their dead like the Jews and the Christians do uh, as a mark of respect. But from the Viking point of view, this is barbaric. You know, you're allowing your loved ones, your nobles to be eaten by insects and worms, you see. Uh, they, the Vikings, they burn them. But mm, I'm not terribly convinced because this burning goes along with human sacrifice, the wanton destruction of animals, cows, horses, dogs, and so on, the killing of a slave girl. You know, it's clearly, um, from a Muslim point of view and a Christian point of view, completely unacceptable. Um, so absolutely fascinating. That's the only account we have, first person account of someone who was there who witnessed this ritual, this burial, this sacrifice, the whole thing. And uh, so there we are. Just thought I'd share that with you. This is the book, as I say, uh, well worth reading if you haven't read it before. Till next time.